first one is on cybercrime, and the second one is on diplomacy in the digital age. And we have two speakers on this panel. Um, but as I mentioned yesterday, we look forward to an interactive discussion. And I think we can revisit some of the issues that we started yesterday, because cybercrime relates more broadly to cyber threats and cyber security. And there were plenty of issues which were left on the table yesterday. So um, I believe our speakers will start by speaking from the podium, but then we'll have a bit of a discussion up here and then open it up to uh, Q&A from the floor. So our first speaker is Marco Gerze, who's the director of the Cybercrime Research Institute. He works very often um, as a consultant, but also with the United Nations, and I believe also sometimes advising the Council of Europe um, in the past. But he certainly knows this topic inside out. So Marco, if you'd like to kick it off for us. Yes, um, thank you very much um, for inviting me over. I was uh, supposed to give a few um, words to you, some provocative thesis, and I, I'd like to start off by, by telling you that I don't believe that you are too much afraid about crime. Of course, we are all concerned about cybercrime, but it's not the fact that it is criminalized that makes us concerned, but the fact that something is happening that we don't appreciate. Um, the question whether it's a crime or not is very much depending on whether we criminalize it, whether we include it in our penal code, or whether we come up with a law that criminalizes certain acts. But it is not really that that constitutes our concerns. The concern is there if something is happening. Like, for example, somebody's breaking into your computer system and is obtaining data. Well, in many European countries, obtaining data is not a criminal act. Data espionage was accidentally forgotten when the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime came out. A lot of important crimes are mentioned in there, but some others are not. Nevertheless, people are concerned about this. Therefore, I think we should not that much focus on the criminal side and ask ourselves, is it a crime? Do we criminalize it and how do we prosecute it? But we should start off by saying, what are we concerned about? What are the threats? And this is what we discuss in the topic of cybersecurity, which is broader than cybercrime. Things can be a security concern, but they're not necessarily a crime. They don't necessarily have to be. And on the other way around, not everything that concerns us needs to be turned into a crime. I'm a criminal law professor, and criminal law does not have the, the, the purpose of criminal law is not to justify uh, having everything in there and making us feel safe because it's criminalized. We should only use criminal law as a last means, if anything else, if all the other tools that we have fail. And the, there is another thing. Just putting it into a book and criminalizing something does not mean that you are safer in any regard. I've been, over the last 15 years, advising more than 100 countries on questions related to cybercrime. And I've been to one country that 10 years ago introduced an excellent cybercrime law, wonderful cybercrime law. You can, if, if you look at it as meeting the latest standards, and it already did 10 years ago. And how many, cases of, how many cases did they prosecute? How many people have been convicted? They had one single investigation in this country and zero convictions in 10 years. Although crimes are happening on the ground, and when you speak to people, they have, of course, been victim of crime, but they're not prosecuted. And the situation is not different here. If I'm asking you, have you been victim of cybercrime, many of you might say, no, I haven't. But if I'm asking you, has your computer system been infected by a computer virus, most of you will most likely say, yes, it has. And that means you have been victim of a cybercrime. We call it data manipulation. But people don't report it to the police. And because they don't report it to the police, we don't know how many crimes are out there. We can't prosecute them. Therefore, when I saw the, the question, how we can solve the problem of cybercrime, is there any chance to solve it? My response would be, no, we can't solve it. We don't even know how big the problem is. And if you don't know how big the problem is, we're not going to solve it. You have to have a basic understanding of what is going out there first. And then you need to discuss what kind of criminalization do we want. Do we really want to go that far? Do we want to criminalize everything like very simple copyright violations done by a minor who has downloaded some movies? Is that the priority? Is this where we want to focus on? And this is part, for example, of the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime that criminalizes copyright violations. Is that exactly the point where we want to go? And what, is, what about other areas that are not even covered by crime? State involvement, for example. If one state is attacking another state and is using cyber technology, that is certainly not a crime issue. That's international law. That's certainly an aspect of cybersecurity and state behavior and state interaction and cyberspace. 
but it's not criminal law that will help us to solve those problems. Therefore, from my point of view, we should start at the broader point of cybersecurity, discuss what are our concerns, and then decide which are those ones that we should really criminalize. And those ones that we criminalize, it doesn't only mean there is an obligation on the people to, to act accordingly, but there is also an obligation on state authorities to make available the right resources to be able to prosecute those crimes. Thank you very much. It's a, a useful starting point, and I think it provokes a lot of uh, questions. But um, before we go down that direction, we're going to hear from Ben Hiller, who's at the OSCE. He's been dealing with anti-terrorism, uh, but now also more with cyber threats. And the OSCE has done a lot of work on confidence building measures related to cyber security. So Ben, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Walter. And also thank you for inviting me to speak to you, this very distinguished audience. Um, in my short introduction, I, I, like Mark, I want to broaden the issue of cybercrime to the issue of cybersecurity and take a more holistic view. Um, and part of doing that is to highlight that issues related to cybercrimes are very much part and parcel of a wider international discourse on different cyber-related issues that has been very much impacting negatively on international relations and especially um, relations between states themselves. I think we can all agree that there are currently very few foreign policy areas where there's uh, such widespread agreement that the threats are significant and growing, but where this kind of agreement does not really translate into a coherent international response. And I think uh, throughout the seminar we heard a lot of reasons why that is, but allow me just to highlight some of these issues once again, which are intertwined and unresolved. Um, for one, we have the attribution dilemma, and we heard about it yesterday. It's still not possible to very much attribute without reasonable doubt to anyone in specifically where an attack, for instance, is coming from. That next dilemma is a different concepts and definitions um, um, attributed to various cyber threats, which uh, kind of hinders cooperation because we're still at the how do we define each threat phase. Another issue is uh, juggling a borderless internet against the notions of sovereign states. This is an issue that is surfacing for the last 10 years. Uh, likewise, we heard yesterday about the security versus privacy or freedom of expression uh, trade-off debate, another point of contention. Um, moreover, we have different ideas about internet governance or, in fact, about whether the current international legal uh, frameworks are sufficient or whether we need new conventions. And, all, and, and on top of that, we all have different ideas what the internet means in terms of national security and defense. So without going into each and every issue, I think the take home message is that states continue facing an environment that is characterized by ambiguities and disunity and uh, irrespective of the particular cyber threats, whether it being cyber crime or terrorism of the internet or actually state and state uh, cyber activities. And as a consequence, um, the responses on the national but also on the international level um, has been somewhat fragmented, fragmented and we are witnessing a certain um, revival of uh, east-west thinking certainly in, in recent years. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that it very much benefits the cyber evildoers, and uh, the response is still fragmented. And, um, and, and in addition, it creates further dissonance between states themselves. Um, the problem arrives, and it becomes very critical of this, is when the distrust has potentially dire consequences in times of heightened tensions between states. Um, all it takes, then, is a simple misunderstanding in cyberspace that cannot be verified, a misunderstanding that has the potential to escalate into or actually sustain a real-world conflict. And unlike in the real world, until recently, there was very little or no mechanisms that could be used by states to act as pressure valves to release the tension when something like this occurs. And um, I'm saying until recently because the OC participating states decided last December on creating such pressure wells to um, create a set of initial confidence building measures that addresses 
potential tensions and act as transparency measures. And specifically, they adopted a permanent council decision in December with a very um, heavy title, and I read it out to you, on an initial set of confidence building measures to reduce the risks of conflict stemming from the use of information and communication technologies. Um, I believe this really is a breakthrough moment um, because states recognized the importance to build confidence, not least to overcome a certain stalemate in cybersecurity debates that has been becoming evident in recent years and actually over the last 15 years, I would say. Um, these confidence building measures um, concentrate on a number of transparency measures and focus, and the focus is primarily for now on creating a platform for information exchange and communication and uh, allow me to just read out some of these CBMs to give you a flavor uh, what states have decided. Um, certainly some CBMs uh, focus on sharing of national views on various aspects of national and transnational threats related to ICTs. Others focus on sharing of information uh, on national measures to ensure an open, interoperable, uh, secure and reliable internet. Yet other CBMs focus on information exchange uh, on the national organization strategies, policies and programs and to hold consultations to reduce the risk of misperception and emergence of conflict uh, that may stem from the use of ICTs. Further CBMs focus on protecting critical national and international ICT infrastructure and to uh, facilitate cooperation among responsible national body bodies, but also among national bodies across borders through the exchange of contact data. Likewise, uh, more CBMs focus on establishing rapid communication at the policy level and to permit concerns to be raised at the national security level. And the last CBM focuses on reducing the risk of misunderstanding um, in the absence of agreed terminology by providing a list of national terminology accompanied by an explanation of each term. Now, this is, as I said, a very first set of CBMs. And I also need to say that all of these confidence building measures are voluntary. And to be honest, they wouldn't work any other way in the current climate. They are, in essence, an expression of goodwill of participating states. But having said that, by being an expression of goodwill, they offer a platform to build trust on and also offer potentially a basis for negotiating new ways um, which relate to specific cyber threats, such as cyber crimes. Um, I believe what is remarkable about them is that states very much, and, and for the first time in a long time, have found creative and elegant solutions to significant challenges which represented obstacles in the past. So a culture of compromise prevailed, which has been lacking for so long. Um, moreover, the list of CBMs is very much open-ended. Um, the CBMs for now do not seem much to some, although I believe they are, but the idea is that they are getting progressively more ambitious, so there's a parallel track. It's a, it's a focus on implementing these CBMs that have been adopted, but also adopting new ones as trust is building. And um, these CBMs are very much intended to feed into process in other fora, such as the United Nations. The OC is a regional organization. Of course, the internet is global. Well, we need global solutions. So this is the first step. And as such, the OC is building a bridge between the national, regional, international level by building this trust among of them of the key stakeholders when it comes to cybersecurity. And I believe um, with that, I'll leave it. And thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So also drawing on some of the issues that we discussed yesterday, one thing that strikes me from your remarks is, um, as, as Ben suggested, this is an issue that no state can deal with on its own. Therefore, you need multilateral cooperation. And attempts have been made now in the OSCE, Council of Europe, uh, in the UN. But on the other hand, um, reflecting on what Marco said and some of the points yesterday, is that an interstate approach is useless because you're dealing with non-state actors or transnational actors in a way that you would 
deal with other kind of state-centric problems, but this is not a state-centric problem. This is a new world with, with new actors. So I was struck when you said that uh, a legal response is insufficient, but then what is the response? Well, let me first of all disagree with regard to the fact that this cannot be dealt with on the national level. Of course we can deal with this point on the national level, and, and this is what states are doing. When we're talking about criminal law, it's, it's something which is in the domain of the state. There are very few international agreements with regard to criminal law. Criminal law is the most intrusive way a state can interact with its citizens, and therefore normally this is not handed over the sovereignty for deciding about what should be criminalized and how things should be criminalized. It's not, it's not handed over to international organizations. Even on the European level, we see that very little mandate was given to the EU when it comes to criminal law. So what the states are doing is they're deciding about their own legal regimes, they're deciding about the technology they want to use, and if you're looking at the conflict in Egypt, and you saw attempts to disconnect the people from the internet, you will see that even on a technical level, of course a lot can be done on, um, on a nation state level. Uh, you can introduce blocking, you see that in the UK, um, also many other European countries where they're deciding about exactly what should be filtered, what technology should be used, and this is applied by national institutions, by enterprises in the country that can, for example, hinder people in this country to get access to content that other people can legally get access to from other places. So therefore, both on the technical side, organizational structures, as well as the legal side, we can see that it can be done, or countries are trying to do it on the national level. However, the countries are also aware of the fact that there might be a certain degree of international cooperation if you really want to solve the problem. You can try on a technical level to block an attack, but if you want to stop the person from attacking you in the future, you will have to cooperate with others. However, I think at the moment there is little pressure in this side because as Ben mentioned, attribution is one key problem. I would like to disagree that it is never possible. In many ways it is possible to identify who is behind an attack especially when we're talking about crimes where financial interest is, in, is involved. If somebody's transferring money, you can follow the trace of the money, and it will t still lead you to the person, even if you're unable to do it based on the protocol to identify who's behind it. But because there is still the debate about attribution, and you can never be 100% sure who's behind it, there is currently still very little push with regard to, to increasing international cooperation, and there is more the look for utilizing the existing instruments. Like for example on the UN level, to say we're using the existing convention against transnational organized crime, and we're trying to apply that mechanism, or some countries are saying let's use this European, the Council of Europe convention, although it only is, is basically only used within Europe and very few countries outside of Europe, let's try to, to do something existing instead of doing something new. However, if you want to do it properly, I think we need something new. We need something on an international level. We can build a very good work from OSCE, from Council of Europe, from European Union, from African Union, from um, ECOWAS in Africa, Southern African community, whatever you, you find there are good approaches on the regional and national level, let's use them and do something international. But surely, uh, Ben, you would need something truly international because if you had, let's say, a cyber attack on the United States, where the server was in one country, but the person who was actually behind it was in a third country. It's like that show, The Weakest Link. Wherever there is the weakest link, it might be somewhere in the Seychelles or whatever. If they're not under the Council of Europe Convention or part of the OSCE, then they're untouchable. So you, if this is an international global problem, you would need an international solution, no? Well, this is certainly something some countries are arguing for, um, but the appetite is not yet there of for all states. Um, this is an ongoing debate for, for years, and you, again, that, that very much, as I mentioned in my remarks, is an issue where we, re we see resurfacing east-west divide, in a way, uh, whether we need new instruments, global instruments, or whether we can build on, on and shouldn't have that, and can build on, on existing uh, instruments. Um, I want to just also uh, respond quickly to, to what Marco said, and, and kind of fully agree with him. Um, international, in terms of national responses, that can, you can do a lot. But I think the problem is that there is somehow and an kind of way how you respond that determines how much other states will be um, wanting to cooperate with you in the future. And I think this is the problem. Um, and that's also a problem with how I mentioned this is becoming so fragmented, the, the approach. So there are blocks of state dealing with things in a certain manner and others in another manner and this is kind of continuing happening and creates further dissonance and this is I think why uh, instruments such as the OC confidence building measures are so important because in a way we have absolute lack of trust at the moment 
and any debates are marred by, by things that happened 10 years ago and, and kind of old, old points are raised all the time. And uh, there hasn't been for a long time a spirit of compromise, which, which we witness in the OC. So I think that's why it's so important. It was also mentioned yesterday that m maybe you don't want states to be too involved in this because actually, after all, it's people using computers which are using software, servers that are in the private domain. But how do you then involve the private sector in working for solutions? Well, I think there is a great commercial interest. There, there, is, a, there is a market for solutions, for, for technical solutions. The people, I, I gave you the example before, uh, have you been victim of, of cybercrime? Have you ha was your machine infected by a malicious software, which in the past was nasty, but which today can be dangerous because they can obtain information, they can turn on your, your video camera. The state is unable to protect you from this, and criminal law is in general not able to protect you from this. If the people are acting from outside the country, you can't enforce it, or it's more difficult to enforce it. Therefore, the people are looking desperately for, for solutions. And, and one of the things is the using, applying technical solutions, buying antivirus software, buying firewalls, and, and, and this is a huge market. Therefore, I think you don't really need to, to motivate or force the industry to get down this road. They're, they're doing it anyway. The, the question is always, it, I've been working a lot with developing countries, and, and in developing countries, many people can't afford it. They cannot even download the latest version <coughs> of the antivirus software because the file is too big for them to download. Their internet breaks off every two or three minutes for a few seconds, and then the download of the file will stop, and it will start all over again. Therefore, the question that we need to raise is, can it be the case that only those people who can afford security are secure? and those people who can afford security are not secure? Is it really a problem that we can solve this way? And therefore, I don't believe that the industry solution or the technical solution can be the only one. We need to have different measures, and, and one of them can be really confidence building. Another one can be awareness raising. We have the Korean Institute for Criminology here. They're building up a platform for awareness raising and, and, and online training on, on those aspects. We can do this. We can explain people basic techniques on how to be safer online. We can start in schools doing this. Uh, we, we did it within a UN project where we really went to schools and spoke to children and explained them about the dangers, but not in a way like an adult would, but we were trying to, to, to use the technology they're using. We're talking about them about Facebook and not about emails as they don't write emails anymore. Therefore, I believe the, the industry is already playing a role, a very strong role. Look at major companies from the, from the US that are in this, in this field. We now need to ask the questions, what else can we do apart from, from technology? But isn't there also the problem that you mentioned, that there's a lack of data, that we really don't know what we're talking about, how big this problem is. Remember in the introductory uh, presentation we did iceberg, that we're only talking about the tip of the iceberg. And we had a figure, which I don't know how accurate it is, but that 96% of all online traffic is somehow in the dark market, but we really, we don't know. Isn't there a threat that this is somehow being securitized for people to sell us stuff that we don't necessarily want? Like with the millennium bug, that was a lot of hype, but was the problem really so big? I think you certainly have a point that um, in a lot of instances we'll actually lack basic data. Although I think that recognition has been um, Certainly in recent times, the recognition is there that we need more uh, data and more information on how big the threat is. And I, I know of, of several studies and, and actually universities which are looking into this issue and doing actually research into this. And I think the University College of Dublin being one of them. Um, just to get a kind of a baseline information, because it did seem certainly in the last years that uh, cyber threats were the new terrorism. Um, in, in the sense that that was very hyped up. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there is a lot going on. And, and we only have seen the tip of the iceberg, but it was kind of a lot of repetition of, oh, it's bad, or yes, it's bad. So in a way, uh, some data was lacking, but, but I think uh, certainly the academia is catching up. And also, I think, in that sense, um, the private sector is contributing because, of course, they have an interest to sell their products based on, on actual data. Um, and, and there are certainly um, some um, security uh, providers uh, that are releasing regular reports on, on the threats um, themselves, so, which are actually good reads such as uh, Symantec. I don't want to advertise for any particular uh, provider, but, but certainly there are, uh, there's a lot of research being done, and, and which gives us a bit better idea of, of the threat. But um, if you allow me, I just would like to kind of go back to the 
cooperation between the private sector and, and the public sector. I think um, while the private sector is certainly contributing a lot to making the cyberspace more secure, I think what we still have is quite sometimes an awkward uh, relationship when it comes to uh, private sector and public sector uh, cooperation. Um, it does not help by the fact that uh, often I think the states try to push responsibility to the private sector and the private sector rightly thinking, well, you know, we have a business case, what do we get in return? Um, do we get tax money for this? Why are we made to be responsible for, for cyber security? Um, so th that debate is, is ongoing as well, and I have seen very little um, examples where, where this cooperation is actually uh, very working functionally uh, rather than dysfunctional. I think uh, maybe in Europe uh, cooperation works sometimes a bit better, but I think, Marco, you probably have to add something there as well because you, you know quite a lot about this area. Well, I, I think this is a relatively new field and in, in, in many fields after when they developed, we see that there are regulations applied just to regulate the market in a certain way. A, a car producer is certainly not happy to build in safety belts. It's expensive, it will cost you something, or airbags or other things. But they're obliged to do certain, apply certain measures. And we, we, we're forcing them, we're selling, if you want to sell your car, it needs to be safe and secure. And we're deciding what is safe and secure. I, I guess in the future we will come to the point as well that w we will understand technology well enough to be able to put this in regulations. Currently we can't. You can't force a company that is producing software to make a software system secure when the users are, are installing it on, on completely different computer systems. And they're changing the graphic card, and, and then they're changing something else. They're adding something to it. They're reinstalling some new software, and you still want to make the producer of the operating system responsible for it. It's very difficult. But after a while, I, th I think in the future, we will have the possibility, we have the right tools to determine what are the minimum security standards that, that we want to have. And currently, the industry has already done a lot. They've contributed a lot. I mean, look at the operating systems today. They, they are pretty secure, and you can't easily break into this, th those systems again. Of course, they're vulnerable. I don't want to say they're not. No, there, there are still vulnerabilities. However, I believe this should not only be an industry-driven process. So far, there is... I find it funny that the reports about how many attacks are taking place are coming from private sector companies that are selling security products. This should not be the way forward. We're all referring to the same kind of studies, but there should be something more like a neutral institution that would look into this without having a business interest. Of course, I mean, for a security company, it's good if the number of cases are rising all the time because you can say, you know, it's getting even worse. Buy our products. But we, we need some neutral view, and I don't want to say that the studies are wrong, not at all but they might have been influenced in a certain way to focus on specific areas and forget about some others. Therefore, I, 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 thi I think quantity is only one element. I mean, even if I don't know how many crimes are out there, I can still take them serious. But I would, I would have to do it in a way that, is, that justifies it. I, I give you an example. We're in, in the European Union has come up with a very new, with, with, well, with a new directive on, on the fight against child pornography. And it includes an element that says it's criminalized if people are getting in contact with children to convince them to meet and then sexual abuse them. That is, of course, relevant. That's something we want to criminalize already at the time when the people are trying to interfere with the children and even before they abuse them. However, we've seen cases where people were, were, were discussing with children and they wanted to meet the children, but not for sexual abuse, but committing other crimes just regular crimes, and it's not a criminal act, because we're only focusing on something, on one thing, this one thing of sexual abuse. Um, it is because we, did, we don't have the quantities. There are more crimes happening against children that are not sexual than the sexual crimes. And if we, if we have the quantities, we might be able to say, okay, the thing that we're criminalizing right now is only a small thing. There are bigger problems out there, and we need to make sure that they're also covered. I don't want to say decriminalize this aspect. No, keep it in, but add some others that are from, highly, from high relevance with regards to quantities. Great. So let's open it up for a first round, both on cybercrime, but we've touched on cyber threats more generally. And I, again, felt that yesterday we could have discussed some of those issues more uh, in detail. So let's uh, have a first round. I feel that you're suffering slightly with the lack of coffee this morning. But yes, Slim, you could be a double espresso for us. <laughs> no, I was uh, just wondering what kind of other crimes are suffering 
I mean, are th children threatened, threatened with, for example. Uh, sorry, what other kinds of crimes are children yeah. suffering from? Domestic violence, for example. No, I mean, yeah. in, uh, using the internet or telecommunications. Yeah, um, there are, for example, crimes with regard to privacy. We, we see that children without any sexual interest um, have been contacted by people and they're interfering with their privacy without any sexual intention of those people. They just say, okay, I would like to get information from you. I'm, I'm, I'm taking information. We've also seen that they've been invited to come to a place and they've been badly hit and hurt but there was no sexual interest in it. Uh, we've even seen one case where um, somebody was contacting a child, the police was aware about this communication, they were intercepting the communication of a grown-up adult and a child, and he was uh, pretending he was a young boy, wanted to meet a girl, and um, he wanted to meet her right in the forest, right in the middle of the forest to have some ice cream with her, and the police was observing the entire process, and they were, of course, not letting the girl anyway get close to him, but arrested this guy, and when they asked him, did you want to commit a crime, he said yes. And when they said, okay, then we arrest you because of this sexual intent in corresponding with a girl, he said, no, I didn't have any sexual intent. I really just want to beat her up. And because we don't criminalize, many countries don't criminalize this, they would criminalize it if there is a sexual intent, but they don't do it if there is no sexual intent. We, we're getting to a point where we say, how can our criminal law system deal with this? We're criminalizing some preparatory acts and others with regard to maybe some even more serious crimes are not covered. I, I believe, and maybe this is because I'm a... I'm a professor, I believe that we should do a, a very systematic approach. We should decide about what are our core crimes, what are the core interests that we want to protect, and then we need to decide how far do we want to go with criminalization. And we should be careful with criminali criminalizing preparatory acts. If you're going into a store and you're buying a knife, and you say this is a perfect knife to kill a person, nobody would arrest you. Just because you say it is potentially, I can potentially use the knife to kill somebody. You would have to get closer to the stages of actually acting. We don't want to criminalize your intentions, but your acts. Consequently, I, be I believe that quantity is an important aspect to make us understand what are the relevant cases. If we have five or ten cases, uh, w we might not even want to put so much focus on criminalizing it, but trying to use other measures. Any other questions? Yes. We've, let's collect a few. If you could state uh, your name and, and where you're from. 2024 side. I'm struggling through the discussions from yesterday and today a little bit with the dilemmas between um, where is the boundary or is there a boundary? What's your view on civil law to international law? And the other dilemma is I'm having is everybody talks about the new thing of the internet, but we are trying to use traditional means and institutions and processes to actually combat that. Would we have to maybe think out of the box to find totally different solution to something which is also new? Any other questions or comments in this round? Uh, hello. Um, I'm very interested in the, this idea of confidence building measures. Uh, this is fairly new, but I wonder to what degree do you actually see an adoption of those? Um, how concrete uh, steps have actually been taken? Because it sounds, you know, very high level, we should have more uh, exchange, uh, we should have more transparency, we should, uh, but to what degree does this actually get implemented? And, and then secondly, um, do you think that this will be enough? And if not, what else can be done? Because I, it seems to me that there are very fundamental, um, fundamentally different views on, on the internet and issues such as national sovereignty. Like, you know, Russian Federation would never want to ratify the, the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime because they see this as an interference with internal affairs. So how can we overcome that, this fundamental difference in, in perspective? Yes. Um, well, certainly the, the, the initial set of confidence building measures has been al already adopted uh, last December with a permanent council decision. In terms of implementation, this is a fairly new document and fairly new instrument. So at the moment, I think we're more at the stage of how are we going to actually implement this? What um, mechanisms are we putting in place so these CBMs are effective? Uh, so, for instance, tomorrow there are going to be an informal working group here in Vienna at the OC, which will actually focus directly on that, like what mechanisms and what communication lines are we putting in place so that these CBMs will be a success. So in terms of implementation, I think 
we need just a little bit more time. Um, the fact that everyone committed to this is already a huge step. Uh, now we need to see, rather than rush it, we need to see how are we implementing it effectively. And this is certainly something we are now focusing on in parallel to thinking, well, what can we do more? Actually, that's the second part of your question. Um, are these CBMs sufficient or can we become even more uh, ambitious uh, in the future. So, in a way, it's, it, it's a dual process at the moment of, of on implementation and how to implement them and kind of considering and thinking about new ones uh, in the future. So, it's a dual track approach. Uh, certainly, when it comes to the international legal framework, I do not see the OC having a role there. Um, the OC is traditionally a forum for building confidence and this is why it was chosen because there is such a lack of this at the moment uh, and s somehow it seems to be eroding currently even further. So we need something in place which there hasn't been to actually build some trust between countries specifically in this area because it's becoming more and more um, important. With regard to the legal framework I will have to refer to, to Marco because this is not something we are really dealing with. Um, we are just creating a platform where this discussion can happen again in a more meaningful way than has been in the past. Well, sure, I'm going to answer these three questions, whether I have three points, but before that, I would like to mention to Ben that I believe that the OCE maybe has a role to play. And within the debate about, about Russia and, and, and Ukraine, <coughs> many people expressed again that they view that there is a strong mandate for um, OCE with regard to quick response. and within the framework of quick response, there could actually be measures applied that even touch upon legal things. So I, I, I think maybe rediscussing the role of OCE would be something that would be interesting in the future, but I don't want to touch, this is more your field. Okay, there the, are the, the two questions. The first one, civil law versus international law. You can't, well, of course, these are completely different legal regimes and we have a hard border between them. Uh, different institutions are involved, different legal frameworks are attached, therefore we need to differentiate. However, in practice, you can't do that. What you have to see is you're under attack. Okay, if somebody's attacking your computer system, it could be criminal law, and the institution in charge would be the police, prosecutor, civil courts. Right, but if it turns out that there is a terrorist organization behind it, what you can see when you're under attack, the attack t from a technical point of view is neutral. But all of a sudden you find out there is a terrorist organization behind it, you might have a different le regime. You might have a different legal regime because you have anti-terrorism laws, you have different institutions like anti-terrorism units, and you in some countries even have different courts that are responsible for this. Okay, then you have to hand over this case. And if it turns out it's not a terrorist organization behind it, but it's a state, and the computer system that is under attack is a state computer system as well, you might have international law. We might have the law of war that is, that is covered in worst case. Or we have the, the question whether some of our very fundamental conventions like the Geneva Convention would apply to this conflict. And then it, the case would again, have, there is a need to hand over this case. Therefore, what we see on the national level is that they're building teams where all the different institutions from the military to the civil side are all represented and the case can easily be escalated if that is necessary without having to start all from the beginning again. That was the one thing. You mentioned the old institutions uh, that are still, uh, and, and the old instruments that we're using to, to deal with something new. I don't believe that the, the problem is new at all. Sometimes my students come and say they have a perfect topic for their PhD and something never, nobody ever thought about and I normally just have to go to the bookshelf and take out a book from the 1960s or the 1970s when experts were already discussing the threats of cybersecurity. But they didn't call it cybercrime at this time, but they called it industrial business machine crime because that was the term that they used at this time. And it was forgotten that the people had very good thoughts about this already. The Council of Europe, for example, looked into the question of criminali criminalizing certain acts and as well as the procedural instruments in the 1980s and 1990s, long before the convention was developed. Consequently, we really need to understand that we can use traditional instruments. And at the end, these are just regular criminals that are committing crimes. They're using high technology. But come on, they're also using cars uh, to drive to a place. It's not really that different. And it, it's also not that the Internet is a new domain. Some people say it's like the air and the water and the land. It's like it's a fifth domain. No, it is not. It is, they're, they're computer systems, they're based in countries, they're wires, they're connecting them. Nobody thought about the phone as a new domain, t the fact that I can make a, a, a phone call. Therefore, w there are a couple of things communicated which are simply not true, 
and, and, and we, should, we, can, we can apply those instruments. We sometimes just need to rethink or we need to adopt some things. And one thing that is very frequently discussed is that the people say we need faster international cooperation. You know, these old instruments, mutual legal assistance, sending out a request for assistance is too slow. And I have promoted the same, and I've come to the, to the conclusion it's wrong. It's good that it is so slow. Because if people are sending you a request and saying a citizen in your country has committed a crime and I know on all kind of information, I want you to extradite him and do whatever, you might want to take some time and go through the case first of all before you respond. Because it could be a political crime that is not even a crime in your country. It could be anything. So we sometimes need time to calm things down that these instruments can especially not be used in conflicts uh, where, where we have two states that are in a conflict and they're now using means of international law and international mutual legal assistance um, to abuse it. Therefore, I believe we're, we're still on the safe side. That is not the key problem. There was the, the, the point on Russia, I just want to quickly comment on it. Russia did not say we do not ratify the convention because of internal affairs. It does interfere with internal affairs. Every international agreement, if you sign up to it, in a way interferes with your internal affair. You can freely do something, but they had a different point, and the point is very valid. They said Article 32B of the Council of Europe Convention is violating fundamental principles of international law. Article 32B allows another country to access information in your country without your consent. Normally, when a policeman wants to travel in your country and they want to do an investigation, they can't simply c book a flight, come to your country, and start an investigation. It is violating the principle of national sovereignty. So at the border, the sovereignty of another state stops, and you have to ask me before you can act in my country. That's the same anywhere. And neither a Russian policeman can fly to the U.S. nor the other way around without having the consent of the other party. And in this convention, there is this clause that says, yes, but if you're signing up for the convention, you allow other people to, to access data in your country without any limitations. And they said it's a violation. And actually, they're completely right. And the, the, the interesting thing is that a lot of th this convention was negotiated secretly. And with a discussion between Europe and the U.S. about the trade agreement, we see that the people don't like it if things are discussed secretly. And it's actually a mistake to discuss things secretly because you're making mistakes. There are a lot of mistakes in this convention where accidentally something happened. Even if you bring, it, it was discussed by a limited number of experts. Only less than 20 experts were involved um, in discussing this, uh, this international agreement or this European agreement, and they made mistakes. And one of the mis mistakes is Article 32b. It is originating from a G8 discussion in Moscow, where in a G8 um, resolution, the G8 countries said we should have this transborder access. But they had one limitation. They said if you access information in another country, you would immediately have to inform the other country. And what did the Council of Europe do? They gave you the permission to access them without any information, without anything. So they modified what was basically agreed before by accident. I can't explain it in another way. And therefore, the Russians are quite right when they're pointing out. And it's not only the Russians. There are many countries around the world that are pointing out exactly the same thing. And the interesting thing is that I believe this could have been avoided. No expert from Russia was invited to draft the convention. It was only selected country. Less than 20 out of 47 member states of the Council of Europe have been, invi have been allowed to send an expert to participate in this negotiation. And only few experts from outside of, of um, Europe have been invited, like for example from the United States, and they had no right to vote. So only the European experts had the right to vote, so sorry. I mean, this is not the way you're dealing with an international matter where you want to have an international convention. Consequently, I believe the Russian point is right, and with having a, a wider audience, having more people having a look at it afterwards, criticizing it or appreciating what was done, we could have avoided some of the mistakes. Yesterday, uh, Eleanor was talking about the distinction between institutions and networks and how institutions are having problems dealing with networks because networks move information so quickly. And this sounds like a case where it's like in the old Western, that if you can get across the border, then you're safe because the sheriff can't chase you across the border. That if, if the information and the crime is, is moving across borders and yet states have to respect each other's sovereignty, yeah, but how do you deal with that? Well, but the, the, the first point is, I mean, the, the UN, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime here in Vienna carried out a major study, the biggest study 
in the history of, of, of the world on cybercrime. And they looked into the different legal regimes and they found that if you're crossing the border, you're not safe at all. Because it's criminalized, the, the same conduct is criminalized in many countries. Where it's not that, that there, is, there are white spots on the landscape where countries don't criminalize anything at all. No, you, you point out a country, even the smallest country, the smallest Pacific Islands are today criminalizing uh, cybercrime as the people are heavily using the internet to stay in contact with friends and families. Therefore, I don't believe you're safe, but the, the way we're prosecuting the people that have crossed the border is different from the, the abilities you have in your own territory. You can arrest them, take them to prison, you, you can do anything. If they're across the border, we have to face the fact, and this is not any different with regard to any other crime than cybercrime, we have to find a way to, to, to see how, who can carry out the investigation. Is it me, the country where the, where the victim is, or the country where the offender is based? And that is, again, something that is very common in tran transnational organized crime or transnational crime in general. Speak to the experts that are dealing with this matter all the time. If, if we're telling them, oh, cybercrime is so difficult because we have victims in one country and offender in another country, they will look at you and say, what's the point? That's the case in many transnational crimes. We, we, we found ways to deal with this. It's just very easy to act in different countries or to cause consequences in different countries. I can sit in Vienna and attack computer systems all around the world, and I would probably not attack computer systems in Austria to make sure that the authorities can't easily get me. It, it is just happening on such a frequent basis, but it's not really any different from, in, in, in theory from any other crime. And it's not that, by the way, it's, we, we're talking about Seychelles, who, by the way, have an excellent legal framework um, on, on, on cybercrime so that we are looking for those spots and the people would actually move to the spots. The cybercrime hotspots are Europe, uh, United States, Russia, Brazil, India, all those places where they have a lot of users it's in, and where they have a good infrastructure. It is not that the criminals are hiding in some strange uh, destinations because they were analyzing which legal framework is the weakest one and this is where I base myself. It's not happening in reality. They're acting from places where we have excellent law in place, which also shows you the limitation of law. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have an excellent law does not stop the people from committing crimes. So it sounds like the challenge is law enforcement as opposed to the law. Let's have another round. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Hi, uh, Inge Kuhn, Foreign Ministry. Um, in the context, um, you know, yesterday after the last session, we had a discussion regarding the definition of network. <clears throat> can you tell me what is a network? Are two people a network? Is an institution a network? Everything can be a network. It can be border crossing. And um, when we are, as we heard yesterday from Russia, and also now today you're talking, discussing about networks. Could you please let us know what you mean? Questions or comments, yes. Good morning, Franziska Kandolf, Austrian Ministry of Interior. Um, I have two questions. The first is you've been uh, talking about a country that has a very, very good um, cybercrime law, but there are no um, investigations, no prosecutions. Why is that? That would really interest me. Um, and the other thing is I'm asking you in my private capacity, I feel a bit frustrated that nobody wants to protect me from what is going on in the internet. <laughs> Do you have any best practices that you could, could talk about that could give us a bit of hope to have more confidence in the products and um, platforms and anything we are using? Because apparently everybody is really affected, but there seems to be um, well, little hope that um, state or private sector can really protect us. Any other questions? Okay, then let's take those two. Mark, do you want to start? Yeah, on the question of networks, unfortunately, I spent, I was on the plane when, when you had the discussion, so I don't quite know what you've touched upon already, but if you ask a lawyer, uh, can we please discuss definition, I'm, I'm always happy. We, we are, we're de trying to define everything. It's a question of, do you want to have a philosophical approach? A network can be a communication between two people. Do you want to have a legal definition? So we would say, in the context of cybersecurity or computer crime or whatever, we would probably say that network is a technical instrument to connect two or more computer systems. So a network can, of course, be two people. I remember in the early days when I had my first computer system, I was pretty proud when we connected two machines. That was already an achievement. Therefore, I think even two can be, um, c can be a network, unlike in organized crime where we maybe say three or more people and, and not two. 
but, but here we, we, we might be able to say that even two people could be a network, and a network can be a cross-border. You can, if you're living close to the border, you can just have a wire and, and, and connect com to computer systems across the border, and that's, and that's fine. Therefore, I'm not quite sure in which context you discuss the question, but, 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 but I, I think from a, from the, uh, with regard to the definition, everything would be possible to, to, to define. It's, it's really the context. Maybe we, there can be a good reason to limit it. For example, you can say there is a certain obligation for a network provider to provide information to law enforcement or to include certain technology to allow law enforcement to intercept communication. Well, in this case, you would not want a network, a private network at home that is connecting three family computer systems to be under this legislation and you would say networks, large area networks or networks that are connecting more than 10,000 people or whatever, we, we might have to limit, limit it. With regard to the second question, why does this country have a beautiful legislation and, and why do they not use it? Well, there is a lot of pressure on, on many countries to actually include legislation and I've been, I mean, just look at the countries that have recently ratified the Convention on Cybercrime, like the Dominican Republic. I mean, the Council of Europe did not invite China, Brazil, and other countries to accede to their convention, but now one of the latest countries that is adopted is Dominican Republic, and I think Mauritius. The fact that somebody is helping them to draft legislation does not mean they have the institutional capacities. The mandate of the Council of Europe is very much limited to helping them to ratify the convention. Now they have the convention and a beautiful legislation, but now they need to train police people. OCE was providing training for p police people, for law enforcement people. The other institutions do the same, but they need equipment. And in, in some of the developing countries, if you say, okay, here's a computer system, they say, maybe I need a generator first because we don't have electricity. All right, okay, so you, you want to do a certain processes and you have to help them. And then you give them a computer system with the latest Operation sh uh, operating system and forensic software, but the software license expires after a year and then they have to pay $10,000 for a software license. They can't afford it. They're not using the machine. I, th th there are many obstacles and therefore I believe an organization that is coming from Europe and is used to the 47 European member states which have pretty high standards does not necessarily know how to, to work with African countries. They don't have field offices. They don't have the experience that the UN has and other organizations like the African Union in Africa or ASEAN in, with regard to the Pacific Islands and uh, the OAS with regard to the small Caribbean islands. Therefore, I, I, I think that the question whether it can really be enforced is going beyond having the right legislation, but having equipment, having training, and, and doing things like this. And there's another point. If you look at, for example, this convention on, on cybercrime, as it was discussed here before, it includes the criminalization of certain acts. So it says this is criminalized, and it includes some investigation instruments and something on international cooperation. But the problem is, if I'm, car if I'm a law enforcement person, and I'm, you've committed a crime which is actually really criminalized, and I have the right tool to investigate, and now I'm coming to the judge and say, judge, I want to present my electronic evidence, and the judge says, sorry, we don't have legislation on electronic evidence. You can only present traditional evidence, print it out or do something, but you can't introduce this evidence in court. You have a problem. Therefore, the UN also looked into electronic evidence. This is something that is, uh, they're very keen on. And if you're looking at other UN lo organizations like the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, they have helped in the last years in an EU ITU co-funded project more than 50 developing countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, small Pacific Islands, small Caribbean Islands, to develop their own legal frameworks, and this included electronic evidence. Without it, you can't do it. Therefore, I believe one of the problems in this specific country, which is a beautiful Pacific Island, is that they have been supported in criminalizing things, but they don't necessarily have the right instruments, the whole, the fully framework that is necessary to effectively prosecute people. And the, the final point is the best practices. Well, I believe that we need to be willing to understand what the problem is behind it. And we need to be willing to understand certain technical things if we want to be safe on the internet. If you don't want to rely on other people to do that for you, you have to have a basic understanding. You have to know, if you want to be independent with your car, you want to cross a desert, you want to know how your car works, if it breaks down, that you can fix it, that you, you, you really know where the problem is. I wouldn't be able to do this, so I wouldn't cross a desert. But we're all acting on the internet and we're, 
I don't know where our expectation comes from, but we're expecting to be safe. And you can't be safe. It's a, it's a highly technical network, and it has vulnerabilities that were built in from the architecture right from the beginning. When the network was developed, it was developed as a military network. Nobody, they all thought about attacks from the outside. Nobody thought about attacks from the inside. Military units within one country don't attack each other. That's a, that's a principle. Therefore, nobody in the design of the network needed to pay attention to attacks from the inside. Now we do not only have U.S. institutions connected, but now we have billions of people, and they attack each other. Therefore, my suggestion would be that you're really identifying what are your key priorities, that you are thinking, for example, about publishing certain information on the private, connecting, using your cell phone for your private things and using a regular computer system for your non-private things so that you don't mess them up, that you have your private data safe somewhere. In general, cell phones and closed systems where the same company is building the device and the software that you find on Android phones, on iPhones, on different kind of phones, on, on Microsoft phones, they're relatively safer than when you're buying the hardware from a different company than you're buying the software from. They have more abilities. I wouldn't say it's better, I would just say it's safer. Uh, therefore, using those things will go along with less vulnerabilities, which doesn't mean you're 100% safe. And then your user behavior, final, maybe the last point. If you're publishing on Facebook, hey, I'm on vacation for the next two weeks, it's awesome, and you're wondering why somebody broke into your house, <laughs> well, that's, big data can be easily analyzed. Anything you're doing on the internet, I can predict what you're doing next if I am able to see what you've done over the last 10 years. And if you don't want this anticipation, you have to apply measures, you have to make your familiarize. But the point is the following, and this is really my last point. It takes less than an hour to familiarize you with this stuff. Go to YouTube or any other video platform and search for security. S for example, safe browsing or permanently deleting information or how to stay anonymous on the internet or whatever you're interested in, whatever you believe is your concern. Have a look at a video, maybe an instructional video for 10 minutes and then you're able to apply it. But the people are not willing to do it. I can tell you Okay, use a VPN connection. Use a virtual private network when you travel and you want to download your emails because you can't trust the hotel. I can tell you, and I can tell you it is for free and it takes less than 10 minutes to install and less than one hour to familiarize you where to download it and everything. And all of you hear it now, and I would say 90% of the people will go home. They don't have a vi virtual private network and they will not install one because they think, oh, it's so much energy. Oh, an hour time, no. And, and as long as we're there, you said at one point, not enough pressure, we won't get there. So it, it's really up on us. I think so IPI offers you consumer protection here. <laughs> A question for Ben, and that is, um, do we have any examples of terrorist groups linking up with criminals or even uh, states to use the, the internet uh, for cyber attacks? Is there that nexus at all? Or is that, again, just hype? Um, th that's a very interesting question, uh, and again, the, the di difference of, of opinions, whoever you ask. Um, I have seen very little evidence that this nexus actually exists, that terrorists kind of buy the expertise from criminals to attack something. Um, it's more likely they do themselves for propaganda reasons or kind of to incite to violence, but Certainly from, from where I stand and what I have seen, is I have seen very little evidence of that. Um, so th that's really the, the is answer. Is there to any it. evidence of certain countries recruiting uh, clever software operators, like headhunters, to get them into their country and undermine other countries' solutions? You see this as in the movies, but is, is there any truth to that? I, th I think I'm safer to answer both, <laughs> both <laughs> Thank questions. You. Thank yes, you. there <laughs> is one. There is an institution, it's called NSA, National Security Agency, that just sent out a Twitter information, a code, um, a coded message, and it was asking for people to join for a meeting on a Monday, so everybody who's smart enough to decode the message was able to, to, to understand it and, and actually join them. This is a way how you can recruit people. So you can recruit people to obviously break codes and, and do all kinds of activities. And we see this everywhere. It's not only in one country, it's happening everywhere. It's happening in Europe, it's happening in the United States, happening in Russia, China, anywhere you go, you would obviously look for the smart people and you would recruit them globally if, if necessary, um, if you have the, the, the resources. And on the terrorist organization, there are some indications that actually really support what Ben was just saying, that, there is, that maybe this link does not exist. 
And the, the, the obvious thing is, is botnets, the use of, of botnets. We have very powerful botnets that can basically take down the computer system of any government in the world. Yeah, I can take down major companies, and you can imagine a company like if I'm, if I'm attacking eBay or Google or any of the big companies, and they've all been victim of those attacks, well, it's much easier to attack a government because they have less powerful systems. But we don't see those attacks carried out by terrorist organizations. Wouldn't it be cool if you would be a terrorist organization and you take down the government computer systems of another government? would be perfect. Why doesn't it happen? You can rent those botnets. You don't have to use them. You don't have to build up your own botnet. You can rent out a botnet. And why don't these attacks take place? Because the terrorist organizations have money, and it costs very little to rent a botnet. Because the criminals are not stupid. As long as they say, stay on the non-political side of crime, they're committing traditional fraud and, and sending out spam emails, they're relatively safe. In the moment their botnet, the, the botnet that they rent out, is being used by terrorist organization, there will be pressure and they will be taken down. Therefore, there, there are even indications that criminals want to stay away from terrorism to prevent um, them being shut down. Can you briefly explain what a botnet is? Okay, sorry. Botnet is a, is a network of compromised computer systems that can be controlled by an organization. So, for example, you go home, you download an email. That's the same thing. I mean, you know, we, we're using emails. The young generation doesn't use email anymore. Therefore, they're pretty safe from those attachments with computer viruses. When you're teaching grown-up adults in computer security, you're teaching them don't open attachments from, from people that you don't know. If an email gets sent to a male internet users between 15 and 50, and you're sending them, hi, I'm Anastasia from Russia, I'm uh, 20 years old, and I've attached a picture, and I want to meet you, most of them would still open that. Uh, you can tell them anything you want, they would still want to see the photo. And then a virus is installed on your machine, that's why I have those viruses. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is how it happens. No, the, so a virus is installed in your machine. You can still use your machine. Nothing will happen. No screen will turn black or anything. But in the background, the remaining part of your computer power is used by criminals. As you're permanently connected to the Internet, they can send commands to your machine, and your machine would do something in the background. And we've seen that criminals are building up those networks because then they don't have to use their own computer, and attribution is more difficult. If I attack a government, they can easily trace me. If I'm using a botnet, so compromised computer systems of you at home to attack a government, I'm only sending you the, com the command and you're attacking the machine, well, that's, that's easier. And therefore, the biggest botnets that we've seen have a couple of million computer systems under the control of one organization. And we have hundreds and thousands of those botnets. You can imagine a lot of computer systems are infected and are part of this, and this is why we're trying to fight cybersecurity issues because, and, and we're trying to even enforce and try to push people towards using secure solutions because you're a risk for the society. If your computer system is vulnerable, it can be turned into a tool and used against other people of the society. Other members. If, if I might add, I mean, the, the thing that what I find startling is that we know for years that the weakest links in terms of cybersecurity is the internet user and the money is pulled towards the private sector solutions and not enough into education, for example, in schools. Um, I think even in the UK, they only started to, to introduce in the national curriculum how to use the internet or computers safely or actually know about the systems in 2005. I mean, that's far too late. And then, of course, you have the added problem, there's a generation gap. Th this is taught by people who very much remember a time before the internet. So, uh, actually, by that point, the youngsters already knew more than the adults. So, so in a way, you know, this is something that uh, probably has to grow up first and has to grow out, and, and this generation has to take over to, to, to address that issue. But certainly, for I find it startling that not enough resources in, in most of the countries are not poured into that, and that's a real issue. But there is a change. I, I, think, I think, and this is where I'm really hoping for, so um, something you mentioned just now, I, I think I wanted to mention this before. I was, we were doing training within a UN project in small developing countries and schools. So we went to the schools, no air condition, we're sweating, and we're trying to explain them something about safety on the internet. And uh, I remember one of the first presentations, we, we did a survey, first of all. We asked them, what kind of technology are you using? What are you doing on the internet? Do you feel safe? Who's teaching you security? And all of this stuff, and based on the surveys, we d designed the curriculum. And I remember I was giving a presentation, I was speaking about, well, things you shouldn't do on Facebook and why you shouldn't do them on Facebook. They can be used against you if you're applying for a job and you upload all those funny photos and, and things like this. And there was a colleague coming over from the UK, and he said, you need to speak about the email attachments. But 
the next question to the audience from my side was, who of you is sending out emails? And nobody was. They don't use the technology. Therefore, w we speak about email security and, and, and things, but a different generation that we want to teach is using different technology, and we need to, uh, first of all, understand what kind of things they're using. So uh, learning it, it's both ways. It's not a one-way communication. Let's have uh, one more round, and then I see one, two questions, at least three. Let me start with the lady here. Again, if you could say uh, your name and where you're from. Yes, my name is uh, Daphne Springholm from the Swedish Embassy. Um, I have uh, two questions. Um, because I'm wondering why is such a big gap between the laws existing and the law enforcement? And I, I would like to know what are the reasons, and I want to exclude the, the question of time, because you always need, of course, time to, to find um, uh, the right uh, law enforcement um, options and um, also the question of uh, electronic evidence. I mean, as of the question of time, I would like to uh, exclude here. And I would like to know who is profiting of this gap, that there is such a long t um, time until the law can be enforced. Who is profiting? I'm not talking about the criminals and the terrorists. Who are the other groups of the society who are profit profiting that the law is not enforced? Slim and then Walter back there. Or if you're closer, maybe. Walter Dorn from the Canadian Forces College. I have a question about threat and a question about solution. The question about threat is how widespread is it that um, Somebody could take hold of your camera on your cell phone or your computer, your web camera. Um, is, it, is that common and, and how is it dealt with? Second uh, is about the solutions. It, we all know that global problems require global solutions. Why don't we create a UN agency or give the responsibility to the ITU or Interpol or some existing agency to do investigations of cybercrime, uh, present the evidence, and uh, potentially take executive uh, action, if not providing it to the countries themselves to, for prosecution, then providing some means of exposure and, uh, and alert. Thank you. So um, uh, I just wanted to take on and explain the difference between institutions and uh, networks uh, if Eleanor is not willing to do it. <laughs> so um, uh, basically an institution is a, a group of people organized in such a way that the institution is an identity for them. So they represent, they speak in the name of that identity. And also they have a history. That institution have a history, a common history. A network, on the contrary, doesn't have an identity, doesn't have an history. They work on a project and then they disappear. No history. And that's the problem we talked about yesterday. The problem about attribution. You can't attribute nothing to a network. But then SLIM is anonymous, uh, an institution or a network? <laughs> yeah. Because it was fun described question. as a structured group yesterday. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's neither an institution, neither. Uh, it's bigger than that. Because it's one identity for the whole world. So it's like the, in, in mathematics, you have the zero, which is a, a great invention in mathematics. It's the zero of identity. So you could be anonymous sometimes if you want, or anybody. But surely there must be a, a cell of some people who are the heart of anonymous, no? No. No, it's just completely open. I think there is there, there are some core people that are, but, but it's, it is, there is a, a great degree of flexibility. The groups that are acting are not necessarily the same. I'm they, sure you're not talking about the core people, for example, I know. Yeah. The core people you know is probably not the core people I know. No, because we have different groups. They're, they're, they're different groups, but again, you would find similar people involved in similar in different projects. And but the group is not; it doesn't have the organizational structures that you would find in in, in, in organized crime, for example, where you have a hierarchy and always the same people. Yeah. Actually, the way it works, just to, to explain to everybody, is uh, for example, your core people decides an operation, a project, etc. It achieves it 
and uh, successfully. And then there is my core people that takes on and takes credit for that project and goes on with other projects, etc. So uh, uh, you can't really say that there is a core people organizing all of that. Any final questions before we give it back to the panel? Yeah, one more. My name is uh, Ursula Froes. I'm from the OSCE Secretariat. Um, I apologize, I missed the beginning of, um, of the panel, so I apologize in advance if this has been touched upon. Um, you spoke about cost uh, factors in, in fighting cybercrime. I wonder if you could say something about um, initiatives or uh, potential of um, education in, uh, for instance, uh, open source uh, forensics uh, in uh, uh, providing um, states and, and law enforcement capacities with uh, uh, tools for um, fighting cybercrime. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ben, do you want to take some of those first? Uh, I want to take some of them, not mm -hmm. all. Uh, Please. Um, uh, certainly, um, there was a question why there's not an uh, international organization or an entity that uh, could do investigations into cybercrime from the gentleman. Um, there are. I mean, you, you mentioned Interpol. Interpol certainly has the capability to do so. But the problem is there need to be requests. And there also need to be reported. I think one of the biggest problems still is that a lot of, for example, companies do not report cyber crimes for fear of reprisal, for, for losing business, for losing face. So that rather than reporting it to, to authorities, uh, let alone Interpol or someone like that, um, that rather not and deal with it themselves so th there's a real fear of, of losing business there is some legislation in some countries that they now want to obligate them to report these crimes but again this is a slow process so before we even talk about how which international entity could deal with investigations we need to actually encourage first of all that these crimes are reported and especially those that are affected most which is businesses uh, in, in the private sector um, costs um, and, and initiatives, open source forensics. There's certainly a lot of um, open source um, software that can help um, law enforcement to investigate cyber crimes. And in fact, the OCE is using some of this in their trainings when it comes to um, investigating cyber crimes. So, so this is being done and it's very much appreciated by those countries where these trainings are ongoing. So they are out there. And, and, and can be an R for free, so, so it doesn't have to be a, a costly solution. And, and, and certainly the OOC is, is using that, that software so, so in their training. So this is something that has been applied and that there is out there and, and this can be used by, by, by any country. Marco, last word okay. to you. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to quickly respond to all those questions. The first one was on law and law enforcement um, on some of the challenges. I'm not 100% sure I fully understand your question, but let me, let's try. So for law, for the, the legal side, it takes time. I know you didn't want to talk about crime, uh, time, but it takes time to implement the legislation properly. It's not easy. You might have an international agreement like the Convention on Cybercrime, but to implement it properly in your national regime to avoid overlapping is pretty challenging. So you might have existing legislation. You should first of all analyze what is there. Is there a conflicting? Uh, is, is there any conflict in law? If you're introducing a new provision, can you maybe amend an old one and so on? So it takes some time. It doesn't necessarily need to take almost 10 years like Germany took for, for implementing a legislation. It, it's rather outdated already and we've introduced it at a stage where it was outdated anyway. Law enforcement, apart from time, there are various things. Like there is, how do you seize a computer system? Well, the policeman goes into that room, takes, grabs the computer system and goes to the office and drops it there. No. As a defense lawyer, I would take him into pieces because I would tell him, right when you were taking it to your office, you could have manipulated the evidence. You have to maintain the chain of custody. You have to prove that there was no manipulation. And if you just turn on the machine, not do anything apart from turning on the machine, it will alter information on the machine, on the drive, and you will not be able to prove that you have not done it. So you have to seal it before you seize it. You have to take photos because you will tell me there was a hard drive attached to it. And I will say, no, it was not attached to it. It was there, but it was not mine. 
So you have to have, take photos, have to prove that which device was connected, then seal it, take it, and it's, it's a very difficult process. Therefore, enforcing or investigating cybercrime is not an easy thing. There is not only the time problem that you have. There are various things. It, there, can be misleading, uh, there can be misleading elements in the investigation. You might think this is the person, and it was somebody else. It was just somebody who was using your network to commit a crime. He broke in your network, downloaded illegal things, and it, everybody would believe you were the person. So it is a, a, a rather complex thing. You ask who is actually benefiting from not having legislation in place from this long period of time. Did I understand this correctly? Yeah, there, there are various people. There are researchers that are benefiting because they can carry out research which is not illegal now. For example, developing software, uh, anti-forensic tools, which could be a crime in some countries um, after they've introduced such legislation. There are artists that benefit. They can use, uh, if there is no criminalization of copyright violations, they can just use other people's art and, and, and modify it and do funny things. Um, with this, like for example, having using a music and then do a funny dance music uh, movie, but you're not licensing the movie, uh, the, the music, because you can't afford it. Uh, we see all kind of people that can benefit from it that we normally do not want to criminalize, but they would be criminalized in the process. So also, financial institutions are benefiting if you don't have anti-money laundry legislation in place. Uh, software companies might benefit. I mean, it, it can potentially be anybody, but at the end, the society is suffering more. Uh, if they're completely vulnerable with regard to those attacks and if we cannot catch the really bad guys. There was the question with regard to the camera. Well, from a technical, po is, uh, from a technical point of view, it is possible to take over basically any camera that you link to the internet or that you have in a device. Your, your cell phone camera can be turned on. We've seen cases where th this was actually done with a microphone because it's even better. The camera would only take a photo of things that are in front of you, but the microphone can record anything that is happening in the room. And we've seen that a network of a government institution was infected with a malicious software. The malicious software activated all the microphones and all computer systems, but they would only record when the minister is in the room and he's speaking. They uploaded his voice profile that they got from a radio interview, and it was uploaded with this computer virus, and whenever the minister was in a room, he was speaking to his secretary, then he went to his assistant, then he spoke to somebody else, they were recording it and sending it out. And this is much better than recording everything because then you find it in your network traffic. You can see that there is a vast amount of information sent out and it's easier to hide it if you only specifically do this. So it is possible. The only question is, would people do it? Are you an interesting target? And with regard to the people here in the room, I can tell you, yes, you are. It is wonderful to know what you're doing in your private life, if you have an affair, if you did something wrong, because this can be used against you. And I'm even telling this to my students. If you're a very talented student, you're going to make a career, and knowing what you did when you were 18 or 20 can be used against you in the future. So having this information is not only interesting for selected um, institutions in some member states that are trying to store as many information as possible, but it's also interesting for people that want to blackmail you Therefore, taking care about your privacy, and I mean, I can, I can show you the screen of my, my notebook and my camera, and you will be able to see that I have put a little sticker. So this is my, my camera, and there is a little sticker here, and you can just take it and put it in front of it. It's very simple. Um, you can also deactivate your, your microphone and things like this, but it requires a little bit of attention. This is what we might have to go through uh, if you want to be really safe. So I would not trust the fact that somebody says your camera can't be taken over. It's just a question of how much time and are willing to invest. The, the question with regard to the UN a agency, I'm a little bit more skeptical than Ben because those institutions that we have out there are actually more a coordinating body. Europol, sounds like, hey, where if Europol, they can investigate. No, they can't. They only have a coordinating role. The investigation is always done by national institutions, by national law enforcement. And we don't have an international organization that actually does take over, like the FBI within the US, the federal crime, they would come and say, no, this is not a state matter anymore. This is now a federal matter, and they take it over. We don't have this on an international level. But it's an interesting approach, and we start seeing a discussion on this one. There, one of my dear colleagues, Stein Cholberg, um, a former judge and an advisor to different UN organizations, he even said, we need a UN court. We need 
a court where those matters are discussed. It's much better to have this on an international level, so something like the permanent um, International Criminal Court of Justice. We need something like this for, um, f for those crimes as well. Therefore, I believe, w th th based on national sovereignty and the importance of the principle, we're not ready yet. And then there was the question with regard to open source forensics, and again, I agree fully to what Ben says. We, th these tools are out there, and actually they are applied. Um, the ITU, when they did the training, when they, they have a project, and they, they discovered working with all those developing countries, they can't afford $10,000 for a license for one of these ups famous uh, forensic software tools that I'm not going to name here. Uh, it's, it's simply too expensive, and they realize there are so many open source tools out there that do the same job, but sometimes you have to well, we, we realize it's even better to train people on forensic, on open source forensic software, because they have to learn doing things again. The other software does everything automatically. You press one button and does everything, but you don't look behind it anymore. What we see is that if you start learning, applying different tools, you have to learn how they interact, and then you would learn it. And actually, there are two promising um, developments. One is in Italy, where some courts decided that forensic software that where the source code is not available is th the evidence produced by this kind of, uh, or the, the reports produced by this kind of tools is not applicable in court, can't be used, because the defense lawyer can always say there was a manipulation and I can't have a look at the source code to verify if there was no manipulation. Therefore, they called for open source and that led to a push in Italy. A colleague of mine, um, Giuseppe Vacciago, did a very interesting project on this and they found a lot of open source software now coming from Italy and other places where there is a push for this. Uh, very good, very good software. Yeah, these were basically answers to those questions. I hope Great. all of them. Thanks very much. Uh, we really have to wrap it up here, but I'd like to thank both of our speakers, Marco and Ben. I feel better informed, slightly less safe, but uh, it, it was a good open freewheeling discussion and, and let's give them a big round of applause. Thanks very much.